you know, so so I think that we're very ignorant, really. That's I mean, there's no other explanation for why there isn't sufficient appreciation of, of Arabian culture. We're just ignorant, uh, you know, and uh, and and arrogant, and and maybe narcissistic as well, and 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 self-centered. And we again, we've taken on sort of French attitudes or British attitudes. So I very much wanted to fight against that in my own work to show how interesting and how rich Arabian culture and uh, history is. Welcome to the Africa podcast. My name is Mikey Menna. Today on the series, we have Bernard Heikel, who is a professor of Near Eastern Studies and was the director of the Institute for Transregional Study of the Contemporary Middle East, North Africa and Central Asia at Princeton University. He's the author of several books, including Saudi Arabia in Transition. Bernard, welcome to Africa. It's lovely to be here. Thank you for having me. You know, I came across your your most recent work first, um, which is sort of focus on contemporary Saudi Arabia. But as I started looking into your work, I realized that some of your earlier academic work is from another <laughs> from a another century altogether. Um, I'm curious, how did you start getting interested in studying um, what was happening in Yemen hundreds of years ago? Okay, so there are two versions of why I uh, got interested in Yemen. One is purely accidental, which is that when I was at uh, the University of Oxford, there was a, a group of geologists going to Yemen and I got an opportunity to visit the country um, to help with translating for them. And I just fell in love with the country. It's a, uh, This is North Yemen. Um, yeah. Just around the time when the two Yemens actually unified in August of 1990. I mean, the other reason, uh, and I guess the more substantive reason is that I grew up during the Lebanese Civil War and um, I was very curious about um, the religion of Islam, but also re Islamic religious movements. And everyone was talking about Salafism and Wahhabism and the role of Saudi Arabia. And I couldn't go to Saudi Arabia at the time because it wasn't open to foreign researchers, um, but Yemen was, and Yemen like Saudi Arabia, was never colonized. At least the northern part of Yemen was never colonized. So I was curious about Arabia, about societies, Muslim societies that hadn't been colonized, and where I could see, I thought then, continuities uh, with the past that were no longer extant in places like Lebanon or Egypt. Yeah. Well, I mean, what, if you go back to that moment, that Oxford kid who went on his first trip, what sort of deep misunderstandings of Yemen did you have or gaps of understandings did you have at the time that were uh, quickly replaced? Oh, I, I, I had no, I mean, if you grow up in Lebanon, you have no sensibility really about say Arabian tribal culture or about um, how, um, you know, in the case of Yemen, a Zaidi Shi'i religious community with its own tradition of um, political uh, power called the Imamate was, um, you know, I mean, Yemen is a very different society from actually mo most other Arab societies, but it's also profoundly Arab as well. Um, and it's influenced by the Indian Ocean, East Africa, um, Arabia, um, Indonesia, Southeast Asia. So it's a very interesting and uh, place. It's also just like Lebanon, extremely diverse um, uh, culturally, geographically. It's also very, very beautiful. I mean, the mountains of Yemen are yeah. truly spectacular. Yeah, it's it's interesting. So I want to ask you some of those those basic questions. Which is it's funny. Like right before we got started, um, you had mentioned your your early, earlier book, Revival and Reform in Islam, The Legacy of Muhammad al-Shawkani. Uh, al and I said to you Correct. that, <laughs> I just want to ask you a basic question, which is, who is Muhammad al-Shawkani? <laughs> and why so, is his legacy yeah. worth writing a book about? Uh, well, there are at least two reasons. One is that he's simply one of the most important um, uh, pre-modern, uh, reformers of Islamic law. Um, he's hugely influential when it comes to ideas on uh, the nature of Islamic law, the nature of religious authority, um, and how to uh, radically sort of transform 
the religious tradition from what had been uh, the legacy that had reached him um, at the time. So Shaukani lived in this, uh, you know, he was uh, uh, lived in the in the 18th and, and uh, 19th centuries, uh, mostly in the 18th century. Um, and, you know, he, um, when you went, when I went to Yemen in 1990, he was considered by the government and by many of the elites who were associated with the government to be the great religious figure, the great religious reformer of the country. And his books are taught across the Muslim world. You, his books are taught in Indonesia, in Egypt, uh, in Islamic seminaries, almost everywhere. Um, and he, so he's hugely influential for Islamic intellectual history. And the second reason I said he's very important is because of Yemen itself. I mean, he um, was and continues to be the most important scholar for the Republic, for the Republican regime. Uh, at the moment, you have another group in power in Yemen called the Houthis who absolutely hate him and despise him uh, because they consider him to be a Sunni, a reformer, a, a Salafi, someone who rejects their tradition, rejects their their structures of authority. Um, but, you know, he's someone who's very important. And, and the Saudis, by the way, the Saudi religious establishment has wholly embraced uh, Shaukani and his works. Um, uh, published them, edited them, written about them, but uh, so have others in Egypt uh, around the turn of the 20th century. So he, he's just, you know, for Islam, for Islamic political and religious and legal thought, he's he's hugely important. To ask a really simple question, when you when you talk about reform, can you give me some examples of what some of those reforms might actually look like um, yeah, that so, would lead to such meaningful debate? Yeah, so, you know, Shokani's basic argument is, and, and by the way, this is not unique to him necessarily or to the Islamic tradition. Um, he, he basically argued that over time in Islamic intellectual legal history, uh, you had the, uh, you had a, scholars who were commenting on other scholars who were commenting on other scholars. So you had this kind of highly scholastic tradition. And yeah. in the process of, these opinions or these layered opinions being formed over centuries, the actual core texts of the religion and the core teachings of the religion had been abandoned or had been uh, ignored. And that the point to, to, of his system, his methodology, was to uh, get rid of these layers and to go back to the core texts. So, you know, he, he was basically arguing that Islam in its legal and to some extent theological tradition uh, had become barnacled, had become overly scholastic and needed sort of to be cleaned up, you know, a sweeping of the decks, as it were, argument. And this is something, by the way, you find in other legal traditions, you know, in the Anglo-American and uh, the Anglo-American legal tradition, you have similar moves, intellectual moves, of course, with different results. So, for instance, in practical terms, it meant that uh, in, in the Yemeni case, a lot of the opinions that were being followed by the by the people of Yemen, Ashokani was saying these opinions are not actually grounded in either the Quran or in the traditions of the Prophet. So needed to be these needed to be ignored or uh, pushed aside for other opinions, namely his opinions, which he claimed were grounded in the uh, core texts of Revelation. And so he, basically the argument, to dumb it down a little bit, the argument is that he's saying this has been a hundreds year long game of telephone and the message has been <laughs> right. changed over time. Right. Ignore everyone between me and the and the source material. I'm going to clean it up entirely. Yeah, I'm going to short circuit the tradition. I'm going to short circuit the tradition. I'm going to go back to the original text. Now, that's a intellect. By the way, that's an intellectual move. You know that many scholars who are trying to claim authority and trying to arrogate yeah. power to themselves make. Right now, the question is: Did he actually? come up with anything radically new? Did he, did, you know, did he transform the legal tradition in radically new ways? Did he come up with new, um, uh, you know, principles of jurisprudence? I would argue he did not. Yeah. It was more, it was more about power than it was about, um, an authority than it was about saying, creating a whole new system. Where somebody like Shaukani at the time, was he in correspondence with his contemporaries 
or was he really in correspondence with his predecessors? Like, was he actively speaking to other people who were publishing on the on the subject in in like Mecca and Medina and Muscat and right. places like that? So we're in a manuscript tradition. We're not in a publishing tradition. So yeah. he would have been reading texts uh, written both centuries earlier, but also by contemporaries in manuscript form that would have reached him in Sana'a. And, yeah. and, and others around the world would have, uh, you know, and certainly in Yemen would have also been reading what he was writing. The other thing I wish I should say about him is that he was the chief judge of the state of the imamate for 40 years. So not only was did he have a, a project for reforming the tradition, but he, he, he had the power to implement his views and his reforms. Well, like in, in an American context, that, that's basically like he is the, the solicitor general. Like who is he? He's the... No, he is the Supreme Court j- judge, Yeah, right? But he's also the person who is, um, as it were, telling you, yeah, he's the Supreme Court judge, but he's also radically transforming uh, the structures of authority and the sources of authority uh, for for the for the legal system, and th- this meant resistance. By the way, he was not, yeah. you know, like necessarily the more traditional types or the more traditionalists despised him. What I mean, like, is there a a a hallmark decision of his that, for example, you were mentioning the Houthis that they fundamentally disagree with? They go to this as their this is the poster child decision that say, see, he's wrong about that. There are many, I, I mean, there are many, many, many. I mean, it, you know, the, from ritual law, from the laws of how you pray to um, the, and more, most specifically, he adopted a political doctrine, uh, which was sultanistic, by which I mean that he essentially said that the religious, um, the religious come or slash political ruler of the state need not be a, um, you know, need not be a, 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 a top religious scholar himself. Okay, so in the in the Yemeni Zaidi tradition, the ruler had to be a, a scholar and a warrior and a leader. And he basically said, no, we don't need any of that. We just need someone who can maintain law and order. Doesn't matter whether he's scholarly or not. It doesn't really matter even if he's particularly unjust or not. Um, we just uh, accept whoever has power, the Sultan, and we obey him. Uh, as long as he doesn't force us to um, commit a sin or to violate the uh, Islamic law. So the Zaydis, the Hosis as well, um, believe that political doctrine is, you know, sinful, radically wrong, and that the ruler should always be someone from one of the descendants of Ali ibn Abi Talib, uh, from either of his sons, that he should have certain qualifications and so on. So that's probably the most important hallmark uh, uh, opinion of his to do with politics yeah. that, uh, that they object to. In doing that research of basically somebody who lived between 1750 and 1850, um, do you feel like it helps inform your understanding of Yemen between 1970 and afterwards? Like, are you constantly referencing in your head at least some of the information that you learned about Yemen from 250 years ago to help understand where Yemen is now and where it might be going? I mean, to some extent, you know, I mean, to, I lived in Yemen for a couple of years. I was a Fulbright scholar there. I mean, so I had to, uh, you know, I understood the tribal structure of the country. That hasn't changed all that much over that period of time. But also, you know, when looking at modern Islamists, so these are modern political activists who claim Islam as a political ideology, they're constantly referring back to uh, not just the Quran and the traditions of the prophet, but they're often re- referencing arguments that someone like Chokani would have made. And so, it, you know, to understand how Islamists function, you need to know what they're drawing on. But equally, you need to know how they're so cherry picking, how they're selectively picking the tradition and how they're putting a modern twist on some of these opinions. So, you know, Islamists, modern Islamists are modern people and they're influenced by all kinds of other ideologies, not just, uh, you know, the history of Islam or Islamic intellectual history. They're drawing on, you know, Republican ideas, they're drawing on fascist ideas, they're drawing on communist ideas. 
uh, you know, Western political theory theories. And, and so it's interesting to see how the tradition is being manipulated, being transformed by Islamists. And to, to know, to, to know what they're doing, you need to know something about the tradition. Yeah. Okay. I want to talk a little bit, move into, into Saudi Arabia and ask you, um, when you wrote, when you published the book, Saudi Arabia in Transition, it came out in 20, 2015. Um, I'm curious when you started, um, if there is a date that you would pin as the date that you started working on this book. Okay. So, I mean, I've, first of all, I'm an editor of that book, um, but I, yeah. and I've written se several of its uh, chapters, but I, I have been interested in Saudi Arabia forever. Um, and, uh, and I first visited the country in 1998. Um, and then I, um, started visiting it again, very regularly in the 2000s and 2005, 2006, 2007, and ever since then. So, you know, for me, um, the kingdom is just an incredible place. I mean, just like Yemen is an incredible place. And the kingdom is the size of Western Europe, roughly. And it's incredibly diverse as well, just like Yemen. And it has a phenomenal political history, um, a history also of uh, religious pilgrimage, trade, um, tribal uh, uh, history, the tensions between the no nomadic populations and the settled populations. So it's an incredibly rich place. And actually, one of my problems with people like us you know, meaning people from Bilad Hashem or even Egypt, people who are Lebanese or Syrian or Palestinian, is that often we don't fully appreciate how sophisticated and rich Arabian culture is. I mean, we think of it as rich because of Islam in that early period in the seventh century, but we don't think of it as being rich now, uh, culturally speaking or historically. So, why, you know, do one you, of the things do you have I have a theory as to why that is. Well, I think, you know, the center of um, Islamic and Arab civilization moved out of Arabia fairly quickly with the Umayyads to Damascus. Uh, and then, you know, you had the great sort of empires of the Fatimids in Egypt and the Abbasids before them in Iraq and Baghdad. And and also, you know, we were, we, the people of Bilad al-Sham um, and Egypt were colonized by Europeans. And so many of us, even before the Europeans showed up, but certainly after the Europeans showed up, you know, got Western educated and took on board Western attitudes and Western views uh, of Arabia and of Islam and of Arabs and so on. So, um, you know, so so I think that we're very ignorant, really. That's I mean, there's no other explanation for why there isn't sufficient appreciation of, of Arabian culture. Um, we're just ignorant, uh, you know, and uh, and and arrogant and and maybe narcissistic as well and. And, and self-centered. And we've, again, we've taken on sort of French attitudes or British attitudes. So I uh, very much wanted to fight against that in my own work to show how interesting and how rich Arabian culture and uh, history is. Um, so, so, so in other words, Arabia has always been on my mind. I've always been interested in it. Um, I'm interested in its oral poetry and its high culture, religious culture. And so on. And so, you know, I'm now re finishing a book on on Arabia, on the history, on the modern history of Arabia. So, you know, it's it's something that I think has been understudied relative to other countries uh, and other regions of the Middle East. So, if you think about Iran, or if you think about uh, Iraq, or Syria, or Lebanon, or Palestine, or Egypt, or even North Africa, Arabia is still relatively understudied. And I, yeah. I, I've I've tried to. Uh, fix that, remedy that in as much as I can with my students. I mean, I have a whole number of students who've written PhDs on, on Arabian history and politics, and I try to do that myself in my own work. When do you think the transition started? Said, said transition reference in the book, aforementioned transition. Oh, the, the transition, in my opinion, actually began as soon after 9-11. Um, you know, because a new king, uh, um, I mean, someone who became king in 2005, King Abdullah, was already in power when 9-11 happened. And, you know, he tried to uh, 
in, in, in small ways, not in major ways, to alter and change the um, political and religious and uh, culture and the social order in the country at the very timid steps, really. Um, so, but those, those changes that he, he tried to initiate and people around him tried to initiate uh, have been fully taken on board by the uh, present uh, king and, and crown prince who, for instance, have shifted the ideological basis of legitimacy from Islam to nationalism, have uh, uh, socially liberalized the country as, as far as women are concerned, uh, especially, uh, but, but, uh, but have not done so uh, politically. The political move uh, of the present regime is, has been to, be, uh, to consolidate, to centralize, and to become much more authoritarian and repressive. Than, than the previous regime. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Uh, just because this is top of mind, I, I wanted to talk to you about it. Um, there is this very splashy story that's um, that sort of overflow out of the world of sports, which is a story about Mbappe getting an offer for a billion dollars to play one year in, in Saudi. Um, and for those who don't know, uh, Kylian Mbappe is one of the best uh, soccer players in the entire world, football players, he plays for PSG, which is interestingly enough is owned by um, Qatar. Uh, Qatar. Um, but the the club that he's, uh, and he rejected the offer, but the club that was trying to, to acquire his rights for his final year is one of the four football clubs in Saudi that's owned by PIF, uh, the Public Investment Fund. Um, and so it, it got me thinking, who runs PIF? Who are the actual humans who make these types of decisions? And what is the structure of this um, sovereign wealth fund? How much does it tie into the foreign policy of the, of the, the broader state? Because there must be, I mean, these are, these are, these impact, these, imp these decisions impact um, the, um, the impression that the world has on on Saudi Arabia in 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 predictable and unpredictable ways, and so I figured that it's, it, it has to be coordinated. Um, have you spent much time working on uh, PIF and how that NCU sort of runs? I have, and I know a number of the people who sit on the board of PIF, yeah. um, including its chairman, who's the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia. Um, so PIF, the Public Investment Fund, is the sovereign wealth fund of Saudi Arabia. Its mandate is basically to help uh, uh, put into effect uh, the Vision 2030 um, that uh, plan of, of the Saudi kingdom, which is to diversify the kingdom away from oil its and it's on oil and to build an economy that's much less oil dependent because oil is going to become less important over time as the energy transition happens. A PIF has a mandate to spend half of its uh, investments in country, and then 20% or so are spent in the United States, and then another uh, uh, another amount is spent uh, around the world or kept um, for other investments in the future. So, um, I mean, the way decisions are taken at PIF is through the, you know, you have different uh, committees that look at different investment opportunities. Those committees make recommendations. They rise up ultimately to the board of the PIF and then a vote is taken. And the last person to take the vote is the Crown Prince when decisions are taken. Now, clearly the Crown Prince has a huge uh, um, role to play in this, in, in these decisions. And, and clearly his, um, you know, his, his, uh, you know, preferences are important because not least because the Vision 2030 document is sort of his baby. It's his plan. Um, yeah. Now, when it comes to their investments in the sports world, whether it's LIV and uh, the PGA in America or, um, or uh, buying Newcastle in the UK or uh, now this story with Mbappe or with Messi before there was a, a talk of getting him, um, the way Western journalists have talked about this is to, and, and some uh, human rights organizations, I've talked about this is it's sports washing. They described this as sports washing, but basically what that means, as I understand it, is that um, the Saudis are buying all these sports uh, superstars or teams in order to improve or burnish their impression, their image in the West. 
because they, they care so deeply and desperately about what Western journalists and Western elites think of them that they want to buy these um, fancy, um, uh, make these fancy investments to distract from the human rights record of the, of the country. Th that's essentially the explanation that's been often posited. Um, I think that that's wrong. I think that people who make that argument um, don't fully understand what's going on inside the kingdom. Uh, and, um, and I think that they also are kind of imperial narcissists. They're Westerners who think that everything must revolve around what the editors at the Washington Post and New York Times think, and that the Saudis, you know, can't sleep if the New York Times editors are not happy with them. Uh, to, I, I think that's a crock of, you know what, um, I think that the Saudis are driven and motivated principally by a domestic agenda. And that domestic agenda involves turning soccer into a kind of religion. Uh, soccer is already hugely important for the youth of Saudi Arabia, who represent at least 65 to 70 percent of the country. And uh, football or soccer is really um, part of the transformation of the cultural and social transformation of the country. Um, and it's also a way of competing with Qatar and the UAE, who each own other teams overseas as well. So, um, and, and there's a profit motive as well. Um, so, so I think that whatever the Saudis end up doing, it's driven by this domestic agenda to diversify the country and to transform their country culturally, politically, socially, et cetera, and not by trying to um, get Westerners to think well of them, certainly not Western liberal elites. I mean, they want Western businessmen and rich um, uh, Westerners to think well of them because they want to in, uh, attract uh, foreign direct investment from Western uh, institutions and individuals. Yeah. Um, and, and also to invest with them as well. But I, I think that, you know, all, law, all politics consumers. and consumers. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, all politics are local, you know, anywhere in the world. It's really about what happens domestically. Um, and then everything else flows from that. So, you know, the PIF is not doing this for, to, to promote foreign policy um, objectives necessarily. It's doing that to promote a domestic transformational agenda. Now, you can yeah. say that it's insane and it's, it's stupid or it's a bad investment or they're silly to try to do what they're doing, but I think that's what they're doing. I'm curious about, since like the inner workings of those types of decisions, Mm -hmm. Like, are those decisions taken? And I totally understand. I totally understand the, the economic play entirely. Um, and I, I understand the nature of the economic play and how this actually, uh, and how much money there is to make in sports. Um, so I totally get it. I'm curious how, how early, if you were to take a guess, how early was that sort of strategy, was that decision made? I'm, I'm I'm always curious about big splashy well, look, decisions I mean, like that. Was that like maybe yeah, nine no, months ago? <laughs> no, no. I, I I think that you know what the Saudis are doing was already done before them by Qatar yeah, and the UAE for sure. So you know, so what they're doing is basically trying to supercharge what they already saw happening ten, fifteen years ago in places like Dubai or Abu Dhabi or Qatar. Um, yeah. So so you know they're, they're not sort of reinventing the wheel. They're just trying to uh, compete with these other uh, yeah, petro the same, states. Same playbook. Same playbook. And, and, and then, you know, there are opportunities that arise. So for instance, I know something about the PGA LIV uh, deal. So there um, you do have the chairman of the, the you know, the, the, the CEO of PIF um, or, you know, someone called Yasser Romayan is an avid golf player. Okay. So he knows lots of golf people. But yeah. a lot of the golf people in the PGA were really upset that the salaries in the PGA were not as high as the NBA or the NFL or uh, tennis. And so a bunch of them came and complained to him, to, that, to him. One in particular, I think, came and complained saying, you know, I have a scheme, you know, to turn golf into basketball or, you know, in, in terms of salaries and money and all that. And, you know, the PGA is, according to this guy, a fuddy-duddy conservative organization we can kind of turn it into something sexy and much more dynamic. And here's the opportunity. And he, off, he presented him with the plan. 
of creating another league and then trying to try, trying to compete with the PGA. And ultimately, they ended up buying the PGA. You know, that was an opportunity that that landed at, at the feet of the Saudis, and they they took advantage of it. And there was no um, guarantee that it would work. Eventually, it seems to have worked. Um, and they bought out bought out the PGA. You know, yeah. now will that will that turn into something amazing for the Saudis down the line? Uh, maybe. You know, they have all these uh, tourist resorts. They all are going to have golf courses. They want to attract, you know, rich and powerful golfers from around the world. Uh, not just Americans, by the way, or Europeans, the Chinese and others, Japanese and so on. So, you know, that's the that's the play. That's how that happened. That that deal happened. Yeah. Would you say that, okay, I'll ask you a simple question and then I'll ask you the harder question. The transition that's um, being enacted now, the 21st, uh, the one that's sort of happening from 2017 onwards, um, leading to 2030, that transition, the success of that transition is not inevitable, right? That's the simple question. You mean the the transition to diversifying the economy, the vision, the vision twenty thirty? Yeah, no, no. I, vision I, I think it's an extremely hard thing for any. Uh, yeah, I, I think any petro state, any what, what right? we call it's... rentier states, state, any any state that depends almost entirely on one resource, um, will find it extremely difficult to diversify its economy away from that resource because that dependence on that one resource creates certain dynamics and certain structural features in the economy that uh, make it much less competitive. It's called Dutch disease. Um, and so, yeah. uh, um, you know, it's going to be very, very hard. But, you know, Saudi, like, you know, if you talk to many Saudis who are in favor of what's happening, they'll, they say to you, you know, this is an aspirational vision. If we can accomplish 20 or 30 percent of it, not 100 uh, percent, that's already an amazing thing because we were doing nothing before and we were going to hit yeah. the wall having done nothing. Yeah. So this is the more complicated question that it, I can't expect you to know the answer to, but just to like you, you, you're going to be able to introduce the right questions worth asking. Mm -hmm. What are the, the major potholes over the next, uh, you know, 13 years that could create friction and stop this vision from happening at a hundred percent? What are the ways this this transition actually doesn't happen um, in any way that feels successful? What are the sources of okay, that? Okay, so so, uh, so I I have to explain to you something about the nature of the Saudi economy. Okay, so seventy percent, right. seven zero percent of the Saudi working population works in the Saudi public sector. That is, that means that they are government employees. The government, you know, uh, collects the rent, the money that comes from the sale of sale of oil and then redistributes it to the population through public sector jobs and salaries. Okay, now one of the big goals of Vision 2030 is to create jobs in the private sector, not in the public sector, and to produce good, you know, high quality, good paying jobs in the private sector so that the, the this young population gets jobs that are as good, if not better than those in the public sector. Public sector jobs are jobs for life, you have job security, et cetera, and so on. And you have prestige and in, in, in having them. So, you know, the big pothole, the biggest one really, is whether the private sector will generate the jobs for, for these young people. And if, they, if it doesn't, um, there's going to be a problem because you have a lot of young people who are frustrated, who feel that, you know, uh, the promises that the government made uh, have not been fulfilled. Um, and you have groups in... Saudi society, namely the Islamists, who are ready to mobilize this anger and frustration against the government. Um, so that's, you know, that that's a major uh, factor and really the biggest one as far as I'm concerned, which is, you know, creating jobs, building a service industry, building an industrial base, you know, building, uh, you know, sectors that are not dependent on oil. Uh, that will produce jobs and that will that will prevent the young from turning against the government, uh, you know, uh, should the jobs not not appear. Yeah. And so who has done that well? If we look at like the last hundred years, 
Is there an example of an economy that is that dependent on a single uh, commodity and that's raking in profits that has somehow managed to make this pivot successfully? No, I'm not aware of any uh, economy that, you know, is, that has done that. You know, the two, uh, the two examples that are often posited are the United States. The United States is the largest producer of oil in the world. But the United States is a highly yeah. diversified economy to begin with. Oil didn't emerge, didn't show up in this country, in our, in our country, in the United States, you know, uh, you know, uh, from nothing. I mean, there was already an industrial base in the country. And, um, yeah. and so that, that mitigates and that dampens the, the, the rentier effect of oil. The other is Norway. Uh, Norway also has a huge yeah, amount of ask you oil. About Norway. And, and, and Norway, again, when oil was discovered, Norway was already fairly uh, diversified and developed as an economy. And the other thing that Norwegians did is to keep most of the oil money outside the country, right? They put it in a sovereign wealth fund overseas, and they've tried to, uh, you know, inoculate their economy from the uh, from the you know the bad effects of of oil runs. Um, I'm yeah. not aware of any country like Saudi Arabia, um, you know, whether it's Kuwait or UAE or Qatar. Um, that's been, a or Algeria for that matter, that has been able to, um, you know, shift to a diversified economy or from, you know, to a production economy, from an allocation, you know, economy. Um, and, you know, there are small examples. There's a wonderful little case of a small island in the Pacific called Nauru. So Nauru, you know, was blessed with uh, guano, which is, you know, bat, bat shit. Mm -hmm. And it's a great, fer it's a great fertilizer. They basically yeah. mined it all. And while they were mining it, the country turned into one of the richest per capita countries in the world. Everyone became obese. They were eating uh, meat for the first time, uh, driving Cadillacs, et cetera. And then once the uh, guano um, was no longer there, the country went bankrupt. Um, and now Nauru lives off, uh, is essentially a penal colony. It's a, it's a place that rents out space to Australia for all the refugees that want to make it to Australia and they get to, they get sent to Nauru and Nauru charges rent for for keeping these people. You know, that's a kind of very extreme example of of a Rante economy and how difficult it is to to transform. I mean that it's it's funny. It's it's it it's harrowing to hear that that this has never been done, right? Yeah. yeah that's right. It is hard. It's, I mean it's it's hard to hear that, you know, yeah. I was speaking to a friend of mine, uh, 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 who I met in New York, a Saudi friend of mine many years ago. Um, and she was in Beirut at the time and she was telling me about all the reforms and I was sort of, you know, um, frowning and sort of rubbing my head. And she said, Mikey, I think we're going to do it. I think we're going to be able to do this. You know, I think these reforms yeah. are going to happen. And I said, trust me, I'm rooting for them more than you are because yeah. Lebanon is at the end of the tail. We get whipped around everywhere. Um, and so I would, I will, I'm hoping that these reforms work because yeah. it's, it will be positive for me. I mean, I live in Beirut. This will be positive for me long-term yeah. if they can happen, but it's hard for me to think they are, that they are going to happen perfectly just because of what you just said. Like, it's hard for me to be, I can be hopeful, but I can't really be optimistic. Do you feel like you can be yeah. optimistic? Well, look, I mean, firstly, um, you know, one of the things that uh, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia has done, Mohammed bin Salman, known as MBS, is that, you know, he's looked at his population and he sees that in terms of human capital, the more dynamic, harder working, more disciplined element in the society or segment of the society are the women. So you see women now all over the place in Saudi Arabia working in all kinds of jobs. Um, that is put the fire under, you know, a lot of the younger men who basically were hoping to end up getting government jobs like their fathers did. Uh, so the women are competitive. They are setting an example. You know, it's possible. And what it requires is a cultural sh a transformation, a cultural shift, a shift in ethics, a work ethic, um, a, sh a shift also in expectations. So moving away from a culture of entitlement to a culture of work and, and discipline. That's a hard thing to do anywhere, um, you know, and it's hard to do in a small company, let alone in a, 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 at the scale of a, of a, of a country. 
But, you know, the crown prince is extremely determined. He's super hardworking. Um, and, uh, you know, he's pushing. And he's pushing because he knows that if that doesn't happen, the future looks bleak for the country. So, you know, he's driven by um, a full kind of realization of w what's at stake uh, yeah. if, if, that, if this doesn't happen. Does it feel like a one-man show inter internally? Well, I mean, there are a lot of people around him that he has empowered. Yeah. But yeah, there's no question that he's the, he's the engine that's driving the entire thing. I mean, without him, I don't think we would have seen, um, you know, Saudi Arabia transform in this way. You know, had the other crown prince that, yeah. who was replaced in 2017 taken over and run the show, it would be more of the same, more kicking the can down the road, more dependence on oil. I, you know, I don't think he would have changed the country. You know, one example of this is that the former crown prince uh, was also the minister of the interior. The minister, the ministry of the interior in Saudi Arabia under him employed over a million people. He was the largest employee, employ, employer of Saudis by far, you know? So the, 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 the kind of example that he set was that of a classic, you know, redistributive Ranchi state. I don't think he would have had the vision to or desire to transform the country. He would have not seen what's, um, you know, at stake and, and, and the fear that I think MBS has about the future. Do you think internally, when you think about maybe not 20, Vision 2030, but maybe let's say Vision 21, 30, do you think there is a sense that, okay, you know what, we are going to actually try to get to the point where this can't depend on one person, right? This, we can't have a Lee Kuan Yew situation. Yeah. We can't have a only yeah. a one person thing. We need to figure out a way to, to yeah. ease the pressure on this one pivot. Yeah. How no, do they do well, that? Look, I How mean, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you, I'm glad you brought up Lee Kuan Yew because you, you have a very comparable case. I mean, there's an analogy here, uh, but, you know, with Lee Kuan Yew, when you think about MBS and what he's trying to do. So the question that you're asking is really, how do you build institutions, right? How do you build institutions that have so. their own, uh, their own autonomy, their own systems that are not dependent on an individual? How do you create fungibility in the system so that you know, if some person slips on a banana peel, he's replaced or she's replaced immediately. Um, you know, frankly, and real in, governance. Let, let, in governance and so on. Yeah. Okay. Look, let me be very blunt. And I think what I'm going to say is going to shock you, but I think the only, the only place I've seen in the Middle East where you do have an institution that functions as an institution and that people are fungible is Hezbollah in Lebanon. Uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon has created you know, this incredible sort of system and, and bureaucracy and institutional sort of hierarchy and uh, division of labor. And, you know, anyone and everyone is fungible, it's replaceable and so on. And I think Hezbollah has done this uh, because of two reasons. One is because the Iran is also a country of institutions. So they've learned a culture of institutions from Iran, but also Israel is a country of institutions and they've learned a lot from Israel. Um, and in Lebanon, they seem to me to be the only kind of group that, you know, has its act together, whether we agree with it or not, whether we like what they do or not, but they, they, you know, they have their act together. If you go to their hospital, you know, Rasul Azam, it's a very highly functioning hospital with very high standards, um, you know, and that's what you need. I mean, you need a kind of, not just a leadership, but you need a leadership that can inculcate in uh, its own people, a culture of, of institution building and of inst institutional performance. And that's possible. I don't think Arabs are genetically, you know, unable to do that. They are absolutely able to do that. But it's very difficult when you have a culture where all decision making is centralized in the one person and where all, all power is delegated from one person. And we're far from that in Saudi Arabia. We're far from a culture of institution building. Yeah. You know, part of that problem, I would imagine, is there's, you know, there's, a, there is a classic sort of uh, stereotype about the army of consultants who, who go to Saudi 
yeah. you know, every Sunday morning and leave every every Friday, every Thursday night, right? That sort of image um, and overpaid consultants who are just delivering PDFs, you know, slides, right. uh, slides and PDFs, right. slides and PDFs. Um, is that problem overblown? Well, I don't fully understand why, um, you know, that this phenomenon exists. Um, it's partly because the UAE did it that way. And so the Saudis are doing it that way too. When they sat, when the UAE was uh, trying to transform and trying to diversify 15 years ago, um, it's a way of doing an end run around your bureaucracy. If you don't have a bureaucracy that can function, you need to kind of create a parallel bureaucracy with ideas that come out from another source. I mean, that's another, that's another reason uh, to do it. But in my experience with a lot of the consultants, management consultants who work in Saudi Arabia, uh, and you know, you probably know a bunch of them like I do, very often they're very young Lebanese people who know almost next to nothing about the topic that they're supposed to produce a PowerPoint on. Um, and, uh, and you know, these guys are essentially producing stuff that they know the client wants, well, whatever the client wants to hear, right? So the client wants to hear, you can have flying cars. Yeah, we're going to produce a PowerPoint about flying cars. Um, now, why is the client, in this case, Saudi, the Saudi government hiring such people? I, I really don't, I don't fully understand it. I have to, I have to kind of, uh, admit to some humility here and, um, the only, um, the only explanation I have is, is just to get around the, um, the bureaucracy that's yeah. calcified and, and, and sclerotic. Yeah, you know, I was, I was having a conversation with, um, a friend, uh, Amirati friend who is talking about the lessons learned during 2008, during the financial crash in 2008 in, in Dubai and the UAE more broadly. Um, and how much growth and maturity happened during that phase and, mm -hmm. and how much sort of, um, institutional growth happened during that phase and, and focus on process afterwards and saying, okay, we can't actually, um, have this sort of be the wild, wild west. We got to think through this stuff. Um, things go up and they go down. Um, how well do you think the Saudi economy would, um, uh, handle that sort of crash right now. So I don't think the Saudi economy is anywhere near a crash anywhere now or in the near future. Look, there's a yeah. basic fact. There's a basic fact about Saudi Arabia that people have to kind of internalize no matter how much they think that we're going to move in, into a green economy. And that is that Saudi Arabia has something like 23% of the world's oil. It's the cheapest in, uh, oil in the world, and it's also the cleanest oil in the world in terms of um, what, what goes into producing it and how much um, methane, for instance, is emitted in the production of Saudi oil and so on. So what I'm trying to say to you is that the very last barrel that will ever be produced in the world will be a Saudi barrel, probably, or, you know, or Kuwaiti barrels, a barrel from this region, from the Gulf. And so they're far from ever having to face like a major existential uh, threat like that faced by Dubai, where they had to be bailed out by Abu Dhabi. And, you know, that's why the, um, you know, the tallest tower is now called Burj Khalifa and, and so on. Um, and Emirates, I think airlines had to also be bailed out and so on. So and that's not going to happen in Saudi Arabia. Um, I mean, it's simply because of geological and material facts, you know, and, and the need. So you don't for, think there's, uh, of the there world. could ever be, wait, so are you basically saying that an economic downturn is an impossibility? No, it's not an impossibility. I mean, you know, you could have the price of oil go from, you know, 75 to 30, and that will, you know, create a major uh, fiscal problem for the country, but not a sufficient fiscal problem for them to face a kind of existential threat. Um, where they need to be bailed out. Um, and, and here I'm talking about the next 10 years, right? I'm not looking beyond 10, 15 years, really. Um, because yeah. I think we're still going to be, the world is still going to be consuming oil. We're still going to need uh, the you know oil from this region. Yeah. It's still going to be valuable and so on. Um, so I, I don't think they, you know, if, if you're looking at a decade uh, or slightly more, that they're going to have to, um, you know, really have to worry. 
Uh, they have to worry beyond that, certainly. And that's why they are having to do what they're doing now, which is to trans- try to transform their country. Interesting. I mean, I, I really didn't think I would hear you say that, to be honest. That, it's like, that is a surprising take. I mean, even if it is like arithmetically true, <laughs> but it's a surprising <laughs> take because, because it's, yeah. I mean, that there are two sides to the balance sheet, right? So essentially it's, it, it's essentially it's saying that like, no matter what you spend, the economy will always be fine. No, well, okay, let me revise slightly. It's not no matter what you spend. Like yeah. These giga projects, these so-called giga projects like Neom and so on, I mean, they, yeah. they, they could bankrupt, they could bankrupt the country if the price of oil is at 30 and, you know, yeah, this they're is what unable I'm saying. to. I mean, that's... Yeah, yeah. I mean, so I'm saying, you know, I guess what I'm saying is that under normal circumstances, the country is fine for, for a good long while. What could bankrupt it is not external forces like a global economic crisis, but overspending on projects that prove um, to be failures, white elephants, right? And, and there are several, there are three, at least three of those that are now fully under construction in the country. Um, Neom, and they, they, what, Neom is one. What are the other two? G- 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 yeah, there's one called Gadia, which is like a major um, entertainment sort of, if you can think of Disney World times 100, uh, there's yeah. another one of those being built. And then there's a Red Sea uh, resort, which is, um, you know, for tourism. Yeah. So, and you know, we, then they're say... also building, building, building new, you know, buying new, more planes for a new airline. And I mean, there are lots of projects in the country. When, if, if somebody like, let's say somebody who's born today, um, thinks of what Saudi Arabia looks like in 25 years. So 25 years, they were literally born today. So mm-hmm. 25 years from now, they're 25 years old. They've never known anything but today and onwards. Is their impression of Saudi Arabia, like, do they think of it the same way somebody might think of China right now, Brazil? Uh, do they think of it like Germany, the UAE? I mean, like, what would be a comp? Like, what would it be like 25 years from now? Yeah, I mean, in if, this if person, Saudi Arabia, in this global citizen's yeah. mind's eye. Yeah, I think, you know, it's a, it, it's, you know, I mean, that what the, what MBS wants it to be is, you know, a top 10 economy in the world, part of the, you know, it's already a G20 country. Uh, it's a number 15, I think, in the G20. He wants it to be in the top uh, 10 countries of the world. He wants it to be like a, you know, a China slash Singapore, some combination of China and Singapore um, as, as a country with, you know, real jobs in the, in the private sector, lots of production, local production, um, you know, a very dynamic place. And that's much less dependent on oil and, the, and where people have zero expectations of ever getting a job in the public sector. Yeah. Do you think also the nature of the relationship with the U.S. going forward is basically, um, you know, pseudo adversarial in some way? I don't think it can be. I mean, you know, Saudi Arabia is fundamental to the global economy. You know, what it does in the global economy is very important. And it's very important for American power in the world. So by far the largest, co- the, the largest commodity that's traded is oil. And it's mostly almost, almost exclusively traded in dollars. That is unique and gives it, gives a power to the dollar as a global reserve currency. Um, Saudi Arabia is also extremely important for regional stability. Um, if you want to have, uh, you know, if you want, forgive the pun, if you want to have the Chinese over a barrel, you want to control their access to energy, you need to have Saudi Arabia on side. Um, you know, say tomorrow the Chinese decide to uh, invade Taiwan. If the Americans tell the Saudis, you stop oil shipments to the Chinese, the Chinese would not be able to function as an economy uh, if the Saudis decided to do that. 
So, you know, Saudi Arabia is simply too important for the U.S., regardless of how presidents talk about it and feel about it and how American uh, Americans feel about it. Uh, it's just simply too important to ignore. And that's why you had President Biden go there on bended knee last July, begging for increased oil production. Um, it's also, if you, rem- if you recall, um, you know, in America, people vote largely you know, because of their pocketbook and the price of oil at, a, at the gas station, the, you know, the price of gasoline at the pump is fundamental to how Americans think about uh, the economy. So a very high price of oil, say five, six, yeah. seven dollars a gallon is one that would sink President Biden in 2024. Right. Whereas the price of, of a gallon at three, 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 thirty, three and a half, you know, is fine for most Americans. So, you know, again, yeah. all politics are but, local. And if you want the Saudis to help you with the price of oil, you need them on side. You can't have them against you. But that's OK. So that answers half the equation. That answers the, the question of why the Americans shouldn't feel adversarial. But do the Saudis yeah. also feel like they should they shouldn't feel adversarial? That's really the more interesting question. I, I don't think this I don't think the Saudis feel adversarial to the United States at all. I mean, you know, most Saudi elites are educated in the United States. Most of them speak English. Um, most Saudi foreign investments are in the United States. Um, you know, the, the, the ties between Saudi elites and the Saudi, the, the entire Saudi military is American trained and American armed pretty, pretty much, you know, so Saudi Arabia is for all intents and purposes, you know, uh, you know, I mean, I hate to call it a client state of the United States, but it's essentially, you know, a, a country that wants to be very close to the United States always has wanted to be close to the United States. It's the United States that chooses uh, not to be. Um, and now the latest kind of, if you want the kind of inside scoop, the latest is that President Biden is pushing very hard to uh, push for normalization of relations between Israel and Saudi Arabia. And the Saudis have made a yeah. list of demands of what it is they want from the United States. And President Biden looks like he's going to try to, in as much as he can, uh, try to deliver. By March what are of, those demands? of 2020. So the demands are first uh, security guarantees for Saudi Arabia from external attack and aggression. The Saudis want to be treated by the United States as if they're Japan. I mean, they can't get NATO like, you know, Article 5 protection, but they want sort of Japan like status. They want um, a more reliable supply of weapons because they pay for a lo- most, you know, a lot of the weapons that are going to the Ukraine are being built by um, factories that would not exist had the Saudis not bought weapons from the United States, right? So the Saudis have essentially subsidized the production lines of many of the weapons uh, produ- productions in the United States. Um, and now those production lines are being used to generate and produce weapons for the Ukrainians. So the Saudis want uh, weapons, reliable weapons uh, shipments. And the third thing the Saudis want is... Um, a nuclear processing uh, program, uh, civilian, they claim, that is run by Americans, but in Saudi Arabia. So they talk about a, they talk about a nuclear Aramco, an, an American, you know, American companies in Saudi Arabia uh, producing um, and processing uh, uranium. And they believe that they have large deposits of re- uranium, so they want to be exporters of uranium to the world. Hmm. So those are essentially the three demands. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, and you you think that that will be delivered by before March? No, that's. I think I think Biden is going to. I think that Biden is going to try to deliver on some of these before March, and he's going to try to see if that's if if that's sufficient for the Saudis uh, to then sign a normalization agreement with Israel. And then if, if that happens, then Biden will be able to claim a major um, foreign policy achievement uh, that would presumably help him in the, in the November elections. So when you, when you think about the sort of the gravitational, the center of gravity for the Arab world, um, yeah. It's increasingly becoming, from a business standpoint, uh, becoming 
pretty odd, right? Yeah. Um, well, Arab, Arab, I mean, the Gulf in general, not just Riyadh, but yeah, I mean, all the money, most of the money is there. Most of the, yeah, the, yeah. You know, but for me, what's, what's actually a little more interesting is intra the Arabian Peninsula. Right. If there is a meaningful shift away from Dubai and Abu Dhabi and Qatar, and if it's true that a lot of the, the, the weight distribution is actually going to move towards Riyadh over the next 10 years in a meaningful way that actually changes the economic dynamic, economic sort of landscape and cultural production um, that the Arab world produces. Um, so I wanted to ask you if you get that sense, you, you have a finger on the pulse more than I do, if you get a sense that that's true or not. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, and the Saudis have not concealed this. I mean, they've told all companies that if you want to do business in Saudi Arabia, you have to move your headquarters from the UAE to Saudi Arabia, not necessarily to Riyadh, but Riyadh is where, you know, and then, uh, so that's one, that's one demand that the Saudis have made. And, but is that happening? Uh, I, I remember hearing that, but I don't, I mean, I didn't, well, they have, I haven't they seen have, a meaningful to, change. Yeah. They have till the end of this year. You know, obviously the people who respond to, to that request are saying, you know, we want kind of a socially liberal space. We want alcohol. We want good schools, you know, et cetera. All of the things that you have in, um, all the things that you have in, um, uh, in the UAE, but you don't have in, in Saudi Arabia. And I think the Saudis will eventually deliver on most of this, um, uh, and you will end up having a UAE-like uh, environment, social environment uh, in, uh, in in the in the kingdom. Um, you know, the kingdom is much much larger, you know, than any of its uh, any of the other states in the, in the region. And you know, they the Saudis regard these other countries as Lilliputian, as kind of you know, like Monaco, the way France looks at Monaco, which is not fair, but. Um, and, 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 you know, they're, they have the largest population, they have the largest markets, that's et cetera. And so that's what, you know, they feel that they should be rewarded for, for that. Um, but the, you know, so, so that means also that the relationship between say a country like the UAE and Saudi Arabia, the competition is structural, right? The competition is not just about politics or personalities. It is a deep structural competition. And, you know, if you think about it, the UAE the brand of the UAE for 20 years or more has been, we're not Saudi Arabia. We're this kind of socially liberal oasis. You can come, you can have a church here, you can have a, a Hindu temple here, you can drink here, you can, you know, if you enjoy the pleasures of the flesh, it's a flesh pit, uh, you know, a, a watering hole, everything. Um, and now the Saudis are telling people, no, that's no longer the UAE, uh, that's no longer a UAE brand. That's also our brand. And so the UAE, I think, is going to have to face, you know, a reality where um, the Saudis are going to take away what made the UAE very distinctive. Do you think there's a chance over the next 20, 30 years that the GCC turns into something that looks a lot like the EU and there's a single currency and a single sort of monetary policy with uh, like a Eurozone tech th uh, type of thing? I, I don't think so, because... You know, it, when you think about the Eurozone, you have, you know, roughly equally weighted countries, you know, when you think about it as France and Germany or France and Germany and the UK before Brexit, um, you know, you have, you don't have, you know, one big country, which is what the GCC has, and then a whole bunch of smaller countries. And so I think the only way that could happen is if the Saudis really concede to the smaller countries, lots of autonomy, lots of um, independence. And that's hard to imagine, you know? Mm. And, and, you know, I, I'm going to say something really kind of, again, uh, uh, you know, uh, perhaps politically incorrect, but, you know, if it hadn't been for the British Empire, I mean, it was the British Empire that basically provided all kinds of treaty agreements with the countries of the Persian Gulf because of India. They wanted to control the Persian Gulf for, because of the trade route. Uh, and communication route from India to to to, to uh, the rest of the world, and so you know that's why you end up with uh, the trucial states and you and Qatar and and Kuwait and so on. 
But if it hadn't been for the British, who were the superpower of the of the nineteenth century, um, and the early part of the twentieth century, the Saudis would have gobbled up all these countries. I mean, the, the, none of these countries would exist, and Saudis would have yeah. conquered them. It's, so if I'm looking at it, I, mean, I just I just did a quick Google search. Like the UAE's right. economy is is half the size of the Saudi. It's not like five percent the size. Um, so there is some there is some balance. It's not a tiny tiny. Um, yeah, I think what you, you need know. to do is you need to remove oil, remove oil from both uh, economies, and then see the and then compare the size. I think that's the more accurate mm. measure, right? Interesting. And the assertion is that the Saudi, the Saudi, um, the Saudi economy is less dependent on oil than the UAE. No, economy. no, it's just as depend. It's it's just as dependent, but it just is mm. a much larger economy without oil. Yeah, because you have, you know, you have you have thirty plus million people in Saudi Arabia, and in the UAE you have ten, if that, with a native population of maybe a million or a million and a half. Very interesting. Okay, cool. Well. Um, this was really, really, really an interesting conversation. Oh, I, I want to ask one final question um, before we uh, before we uh, get off. Um, there is a uh, I want to ask about Saudi's relationship with China and how that might change over the course of the next 10, 15 years vis-a-vis um, -vis, um, the U.S.'s relationship with China. Is it possible that Saudi is able to have two excellent relationships, one with U.S. and one with China at the same time? Well, so the relationship with the United States, the Saudi relationship with the United States is about um, culture, security, uh, military procurement, um, education. The relationship with China is almost entirely commercial. I mean, there's nothing else. It's just about trade. And so... It's a strange situation where you have a country that is oriented towards America for security and, and geopolitics and oriented towards China f for, e for economics. And I don't know how sustainable that, that balance is. And as the Americans increasingly want to distance themselves from the Saudis, especially if we turn more isolationist, then the Saudis will definitely turn increasingly towards China, but they're not natural sort of allies. Um, Chinese and the Saudis, you know, have, you know, a, a relation. I mean, there's no, there's no cultural affinity necessarily there. Uh, there's a real difficulty with trust. Uh, and one of the most difficult projects that the Saudis ever built was a major refinery in China. And it took, it was the longest negotiation ever, um, simply because, you know, the cultures are very, very different. Um, and, um, you know, that's going to get better over time. And then the other thing about about China is they don't have the force projection that the United States has. Um, now, what's interesting about China, though, from an American perspective, is that the Chinese want a stable and reliable supply of energy from the Gulf to the rest of the world, and especially to China. The, the Americans want the same mm. thing. So that's why recently when the Saudis struck a, 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 an agreement with the Iranians to a, a detente agreement with the Iranians, and it was... Uh, it was overseen or given the kind of cover by China, um, the American administration welcomed it because, you know, actually it was China's use of its economic power to have some leverage over the Iranians to get them, you know, to agree with the Saudis. And that, you know, creates more stability, more order in the region. And the Americans welcomed that. But, yeah. you know, the the relationship between Saudi and China is, you know, far from... Um, being as intimate and as, um, uh, you know, I, I, you know, with, with deep kind of overlapping interests as, as the relationship between uh, Saudi Arabia and America is. Would you say that um, if a peace uh, deal is signed, um, a, um, a uh, Abraham Accords-esque peace deal is signed between Saudi and Israel, does that make the likelihood of a um, does that make the likelihood of Iran and Saudi Arabia um, becoming friendlier and closer uh, more likely or less likely? 
in the, I, near, I don't in the short that, term. Uh, yeah, I, I don't. I don't think the Iranians and the Saudis, with this present regime in Iran, will ever have friendly relations, um, or or close relations. At, at best, they'll have, you know, relations where each knows kind of the limits of of uh, where the limits are. The, the nature of the Iran regime is revolutionary and profoundly anti-Saudi. Um, and this, the Iranians want to see the Americans kicked out of the Middle East, uh, and the Saudis want the Americans to stay in the Middle East. So th- th- there's no meeting of, um, uh, of, you know, of eyes or a meeting of interests between the Saudis and the Iranians whatsoever. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to ask you our four quick questions and then wrap up. The first question is, what are you reading or watching these days? Well, I'm in the very remote region of in Mount Lebanon with very poor internet connection, so I'm not watching much <laughs> these days. But uh, but I'm reading I'm reading a, I'm reading a book about uh, uh, Lebanon by an author, a Lebanese author called Majdalani, which is about the Mount uh, the Mount Lebanon. Um, and, and it's in French and and it's a really lovely book. I strongly recommend it. I recommend the author. He he has a beautiful style in French. Um, and what's the um, name? Would you mind saying the name? I think it's, uh, I think it's, um, I try to remember the name of the, the, it'll come back to me. And, um, but the author is Majdalani and he, I think he's a professor here at one of the universities in Beirut. Um, and, um, I'm also reading um, um, a, a, a biography uh, on MBS uh, that I have I hadn't read until now, um, and and not really uh, you know appreciating uh, its quality. Uh, the author and the title will remain un, unnamed. Um, and that, uh, then I'm reading a bunch of chapters by graduate students, PhD students that I have, uh, but mostly what I'm doing uh, other than writing is working on my farm, which is what I have here. And, um, and I'm uh, trying to start a vineyard. I'm trying to start um, a winemaking production uh, here in the mountains. And okay. so that's, that's what's most exciting me. Okay, I expect, uh, I expect a bottle at some point. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Um, who would you love to shadow for a day past or present? Oh my God, that, what a question. Um, well, I mean, as a, as a, as an Arabian kind of, uh, enthusiast, I would love to have, to be able to have spent a day either with King Abdulaziz, the founder of the Saudi kingdom or Imam Yahya, the last great Imam of, of Yemen. Um, I mean, aside from, you know, the kind of small boy fantasies of wanting to see Alexander the Great or Caesar and so on, which would have been wonderful. Or, or maybe one of the early um, warriors uh, and generals of the Islamic armies, like you know Khalid ibn Walid, that would have been nice. Maybe hanging out in Baghdad during the t- height of the Abbasid period would have been fantastic. Abu Nawas, I think, would be someone I would love to have spent an evening with, um, drinking. Uh, so, sorry, that's a lot of answers, but there that, are a lot of people I would like to shit. There are a lot of people I would like to shadow. And that's fantastic. Um, yeah. Um. Last question, or two more questions. What do you think people most misunderstand about your work? Oh, gosh. You know, frankly, I don't care what they understand or don't understand. You know, I know that's a terrible thing to say, but, you know, I do my work and it has a life of its own. And, you know, it, people, you know, have, you know, you have people who have agendas and ideologies and they will hate what you write or like what you write. Um, I, I really, you know, a, a very good friend of mine is Salman Rushdie, the author. And he told me two things, which I strongly um, have stayed with me, and I would strongly advise, uh, you know, and give 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 out as advice to other people. So the two things he said to me was one, you wake up every morning with a certain amount of creative energy. Don't waste it on emails and crap. Just you know, write or do whatever that's creative that you need to do, and you know, when you get up. I think that's very good advice. The second thing that he told me was, you actually don't write for others; you write for yourself. And I think that's true, you know, yeah. and we're the toughest kind of judges of our own work. So, you know, I, I, that's, that's kind of how I feel about it. And, um, I frankly, you know, one of the privileges of having tenure at, at, a, at a, you know, an American university is not to think about or care about what others think. Yeah. 
But I mean, speaking of tenure at university, there are many people who it's, you know, how, how can I say this? I mean, there are a lot of people who I'm sure come to conclusions about your work that are, in, that are incorrect, let's say, who want yeah. to actually understand. I mean, they're not, they're not sort of haters, so to speak. Right. You know, I would welcome them to come and talk to me or to yeah. exchange emails with me or to, you know, attend my classes. But, you know, also my ideas change over time. You know, I'm not like stuck in, you know, one mode. I mean, I, my views, for instance, on Islamists have changed quite a bit over my career. Initially, I thought when I was very young, I thought they were just, uh, you know, kind of a, an avatar of medieval people, that they were just medieval people, but living in the modern world. But I've come to the view that they're actually much more modern, in fact, entirely modern. And the medieval stuff is just, uh, it's just, uh, it's just window dressing for, for their own purposes. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, my, yeah. my views change and, 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 uh, um, you know, and as long as I, uh, you know, s stay true to, to, to myself, you know, I think that's, that's what matters. Yeah. You know, um, the last question is outside of your profession, whose work inspires you to, to keep on publishing and keep on working? Where do you get your inspiration from? Well, I mean, you've asked me, um, you know, you, you've asked me outside my profession, but let me, let me just say something about my profession. There are people in my profession who are <laughs> like towering figures. I mean, they're incredible scholars uh, for whom I have like incredible respect, you know, incredible. Uh, one of them is Lebanese, by the way, Rudwana Sayyid, who's a great scholar of Islam. Um, my colleague at Princeton, Michael Cook, is just, a, you know, just like a, I mean, just a phenomenon, you know, a, as a scholar uh, in terms of, you know, his range and his, you know, the, the seriousness with which he does this. Also, another scholar at Princeton, uh, Muhammad Qasim Zaman, who's my colleague, again, huge, huge respect for him and for his scholarship. Um, uh, outside... My... I want to interview all these people, just by the way. If you're listening, yeah. I want to interview they're, all yeah. Yeah. They're, they're incredible. I mean, at Princeton, we have some remarkable people. But, you know, of course, there are remarkable people else, elsewhere, too. Um, Khaled Rwaihib, for instance, at Harvard, who's also Lebanese. Amazing, amazing scholar. Um, uh, uh, and also, uh, you, know, uh, uh, they're, they're, you know, they're Marion Katz at NYU is amazing. Um, and lots of others. I mean, I could just go on and on. Um, outside my field, who are people that I really admire and, and, uh, okay. So I just met the director of the ICRC of the International Committee of the Red Cross, who is Lebanese and who's someone you should definitely interview as well. Um, yeah. and, and, uh, yeah, his name is Robert Mardini, uh, amazing, amazing human being. I mean, what the ICRC does around the world is just incredible. And, uh, so I, I love, I, I love some of the people in the humanitarian world and the risk they take, uh, you know, to, to, to make the world a better place. Um, I don't like politicians as a, as a rule. I have zero respect for them, especially Lebanese politicians. Um, but, but, um, you know, I mean, there are lots of people that I just, you know, I have a colleague who's a plasma physicist in in, in Princeton, Edgar Schwery, who's also Lebanese, amazing human being. I mean, just incredible. Uh, it's polymath. Yeah. Um, he's a great, he knows Zajal, by the way. He's a great, uh, you know, uh, practitioner wow. of Lebanese Zajal. Yes. In addition to being a, 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 you know, a great magician and a great uh, scholar of plasma physics. So another person you should put on your list. Yeah. Okay, so I have one last question related to what you just said. You just said you don't like politicians. Yeah. Would you describe MBS as a politician? Oh, uh, he, absolutely. I mean, he, he not only is a politician, he's a politician's politician. I mean, he has the, he has the uh, skill. I mean, he, he has a skill that I've only seen uh, in, with Bill Clinton in my own experience. 
So when you, when you meet Bill Clinton, he makes you feel like you're the center of the world. And MBS has the same skill. He makes you really feel like you're someone very special. And that's a, that, that has to do with charisma. Um, so he's definitely a politician, but, he's, but MBS also is not just, you know, your run-of-the-mill politician. He's someone who is on a mission to transform his country. He's also an authoritarian, and he has been extremely, um, you know, uh, nasty, if you like, or repressive when it comes to uh, those who disagree with him, those who criticize him. A lot of political dissent has been shut down. That's not a side of him that I, um, I either appreciate or like. Um, and uh, he has an argument for why he has to be repressive because he's trying to change his country. It's a moment of transitions. It's a moment of, of possible instability. So being hard and repressive, like, um, you know, I don't know, Kamal Ataturk was in Turkey or Lee Kuan Yew in, in Singapore uh, were, um, you know, every authoritarian has an excuse for why they're authoritarian. But he's a transformational figure. And I think that if MBS succeeds in transforming his country and eventually building the institutions that we all hope for and hopefully also toning down the autocratic tendencies and turning the country into a more representative uh, political political uh, entity in space, then he will go down as one of the great, uh, you know, one of the great Arab leaders and Muslim leaders of the 21st century. But that's, you know, the jury is still out on that. Yeah. Do you think of, do you think he thinks of himself as a Muslim leader? As a Muslim leader? No, just when you, when those words came out, I thought to myself that that's, objectively true and obviously he's the he is leading um uh, a kingdom that has mecca and medina in it the, the holy yeah. sites of islam obviously he is a muslim leader without doubt objectively but i've never actually heard him uh described in that way and it struck me as interesting i wonder if he thinks of himself in that way too well he definitely thinks of himself as a muslim and he also is a scholar yeah. i mean he studied law in, in at university so he knows quite a bit about Islamic law and he's trying to actually revamp the Islamic legal system and the legal system in general in Saudi Arabia. So, you know, he has a lot to say about Islam and, and he knows quite a bit about it. Um, he also has habits that only a Muslim would have. Like, for instance, I don't know if you noticed, but when Saudi Arabia beat Argentina in Qatar, you know, in that, in that game, in the, in the soccer game. Yeah, the first game. Um, yeah. You know, he, he did the sajda. He did a prostration right? To thank God. I mean, no one but a Muslim would do that, right? So yeah, and he's going to end up becoming yeah. the guardian of the two holy mosques. So yeah, I mean, obviously he will be seen as a, as a Muslim leader and, and he is a Muslim leader. There's no question about that. Yeah. When you, if you sit with him, um, it, it's funny you're saying like he, he would defend the authoritarian streak is, yeah. is he kind of just pragmatic about this? Like, all right, this is what I got to do. And I know this about myself. It's almost like somebody who well, says, uh, "Like, oh, you know, I like." I mean, let I let really... me give you an, let me let me give you a real anecdote, okay? If, in case you're interested. And by the way, before I talk yeah. about that, let me just go back. the 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 book that I I'm reading right now is called L'Empereur à pied, so the Emperor on foot, and the author is Sharif Majdanani, uh, um, perfect Lebanese author, uh, and uh, and a wonderful book. Um, so. I'll tell you an anecdote of an exchange I had with MBS uh, last December. So at one point in the, in the discussion, we talk, we talk in Arabic. At one point in the discussion, he said to me, he said, you know, I've been extremely harsh with, my, with the dissidents, with the, op with the opposition. He didn't call them dissidents. He called them the opposition. And I might be wrong in having done this. But, you know, I think to myself, mm -hmm. what happened in your country? So now he's talking about the United States. What happened in your country when you abolished slavery? He says, when you abolished slavery, you ended up in a civil war, 700,000 dead, several million injured, the country nearly imploded. Um, I don't want that to happen here. I'm transforming my country um, and I want to keep uh, the violence and the instability to a minimum. Now, you know, that's a very, any authoritarian would give you the argument that order and stability is more important than, you know, human rights. And that's the argument he was making. But it's also true uh, and if you go back to Alexis de Tocqueville, when he talks about the French Revolution and the Ancien Regime, that, you know, when a regime is trying to transform itself, it is, it is at its most vulnerable. It is when things can just blow up 
and you can end up in with chaos and with bloodshed and civil wars and so on. So far in Saudi Arabia, despite the imprisonment of hundreds of people, uh, probably the torture of many as well, um, the uh, exiling of many, many others because they fled, et cetera. So, you know, the human rights record in Saudi Arabia is uh, truly abysmal. Um, we haven't had a civil war. And that is not something that I would have predicted. If you had told me 10, 15 years ago that you would see the transformations that are happening in Saudi Arabia, I would say the Islamists, whether Al-Qaeda or the Islamic State or some form of Wahhabism, would, you know, would go up in arms against the state and you would end up in a very serious um, war, uh, you know, which we've seen, by the way. And between 2003 and 2006, there was a war between Al-Qaeda and the state. So I would have expected a lot more bloodshed and we haven't seen it. Um, it's come at a is very high still cost. Risk of that, is there still risk of that happening? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Bernard, thanks so much for making time to speak to me. This has been so enlightening. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. It's a real pleasure. Hope we get to meet face to face um, someday. I hope so too. If anyone's interested in finding your books, both the book about Saudi, Saudi Arabia and transition, which we've been talking about, as well as the book about Yemen, um, you can find it everywhere. It's all, all online. And if you're interested in reaching out to Bernard, you can look him up and his information's up on his Princeton website. Bernard, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.